treating people as opposed to curing people. Yeah. What, like, in regards to this analogy, do you feel like you've seen what that is? Or, like, what's that little energetic thing that's preventing us from taking this next step into actually curing people? Well, first of all, physicians, which, hey, excellent for emergency medicine, by the way. I mean, I applaud them there. Um, They're not educated in it. Literally, that's not the education they receive. So it isn't a, you know, this isn't like a um, physicians are terrible and bring them all down. It's they're not literally learning what medicine is. They're learning pharmaceutical science, and that is what they're taught from. It's that simple. Medical schools teach pharmaceutical science. They literally teach completely outdated, disproven medicine that is not real science anymore. It isn't even true science. You know, we're always evolving. We're always learning more all the time. They're not educated with updated science and they're not allowed to be because of who's in charge of providing the education in those institutions. So when you're educated in a certain thing, you're doing the best with what you've learned, right? And then we say, doctor knows best. Well, no, the doctor knows what she or he has been educated in. There's a difference. And this is mm-hmm. why it's so critical. If we had a true mass awakening on this planet, which will only help only happen if enough of us get elevated enough to the highest, highest levels possible in our divinity that we can create this energetic shift. If we have this true mass awakening, there would be no such thing anymore as we are, you know, brainwashed or ignorant to what medicine really is. Medicine was blocked forever ago. And there was a shift in um, what medicine was, is what today we call holistic medicine or naturopath or, you know, whatever. It's insane. That was all shut down decades ago. And the only thing that was allowed to come through were the things that were going to make people money. And then the the systems, um, institutions, medical institutions, medical schools were, well, we're only going to fund you if you teach this. That literally was what was happening. So physicians go to med school and they learn everything to the best of their ability, but they're not learning all of this other stuff. They're only learning what they are given to learn, if that makes sense. That right there is the biggest problem that we have. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there like... Uh... Cause it kind of felt like a general statements of just like, they started blocking this, they started moving this, they stopped doing that. It was there certain events that occurred where there certain people in play that guided our medicine, guided Western medicine down this road that we're experiencing today. I think that anybody that wants to go down the rabbit hole in history, I would encourage them to do it. I would encourage them to do it. You can, you can research and figure out it's very easy to look up and learn all the steps and where we took the wrong turns that we took when it came to like our medical industry. Um, I think the most important thing is to not, not that you shouldn't focus on that and go learn it. I don't want anybody to misunderstand my words, but the most important thing is how can we focus on the truth, the divine truth that we can actually heal far greater than we've ever been led to believe. And I think that's what it's what we should focus on the most because that's what's most important. I think people get trapped in the the going down the rabbit holes. Not that you shouldn't. Again, I don't want anybody to think you're. Glo- I'm glossing over it. But let's focus on the fact, the truth, that because we've been misled, because there is a miseducation out there, because this isn't mainstream, because it wouldn't make as much money for certain groups of people. This is what we want to awaken to. How can we really change our health, our mental health, our emotional health? You can learn how to do that. And it doesn't rely on tools or taking pharmaceuticals or anything else. You can just learn how to function in the divinity that you are, which means you're learning energetic science. You're learning to work with energies because your energy, understanding your human body, understanding your your mental field and your emotional energetic field that that surrounds your body, those subtle energy bodies, 
is where everything gets trapped. All of your traumas, all of your unhealed stuff is actually in your fields around you. And guess what? I'm going to come full circle. That is actually the matrix you're creating 100% of the time. And that is the matrix that interacts with all of the collective matrix in the world. And they're feeding each other because that is oneness consciousness is a science of oneness. It's not just some woo-woo spiritual, you know, made up nonsense. We learn that we can learn how to change all of that and break away from systems that are there to just use us to, to make them wealthier or what, you know, whatever the example might be. So I think the critical piece is let's understand ourselves as an expansive energetic being, as this mystical being, I often say, even though that might sound a little out there for some, it's based in energetic science. You know, let's function from that place. Have you, I'm trying to look it up right now. I wish I could find it. Oh, maybe I need to type that in. Have you been aware of there's like uh, this new idea that's been uh, brought forth? I first learned about it in podcast number, Odyssey number 80, towards the end of it for those listening. But it's this idea that we live in like a nine dimensional universe. It's called like a 90 plus model with gimbal. Are you familiar with that at all? No. It's we definitely very... live in a multi-dimensional universe. I can yeah. tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so these scientists took it upon themselves. I want to see if I can find like the actual article that I was reading whenever I went through this. Maybe I can go to the Buzzsprout article or not the Buzzsprout article, but the interview. Cause I think I put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, there it is. Our 90 model, because you're talking about how and I, I don't know why I'm bringing this up. I, I feel like you would really enjoy this. It's called the NEP close triadic dimensional vortical paradigm. And wow. so what was going on was, is like, you know, three dimensional, the standard model of physics is based on three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And however, they've acknowledged that there's like all these different things that it doesn't account for. Mm -hmm. Apparently there's like 50 things. So these, um, let me see if I can find the name. Yeah. So Vernon Nepp and Edward Close took it upon themselves because they were like, okay, let's figure out there's clearly other shit going on here. And what they found was, or where the model that they have put forth is um, this 90 plus model. Mm -hmm. And so there's nine dimensions, but then there's this underlying energy that they call Gimel mm -hmm. that is a massless and energyless sort of thing that like binds all of it together. Mm hmm. And I find this, you know, very fat because you, you're clearly very uh, well spoken and energized on the idea of oneness. It has me thinking that this Gimel concept that they're talking about is that oneness thing that exists between everything and everyone and every dimension. It's what interconnects us. It's what connects everything as one. It is outside of us. It is inside of us. It connects us in our physical forms in order for us to experience a, a false sense of separation, so to speak, but also live as the connected oneness beings that we truly are. You can never not be connected, can never not be in oneness, except for what you manifest in your experiences, in your, in your human realities, because we're here to experience separateness just in a certain way, meaning that you and I are in two different bodies right now. You know, you're, you're a man, I'm a woman, like that's, that's separate because we're here to just experience our divine selves as that, as those manifested things. You know, it's, it's oneness consciousness creating things to experience itself as these other things, but we're never truly separate. We are still all connected. And what connects us all? Yeah. Whatever names they give it, because that's for scientists to, to do. I don't do that part. I can tell you, though, that I read and see energy everywhere. And I can see the pulses that are connected when people walk by each other. For example, your fields connect automatically with people when you walk by them. They, inter they entangle. It happens mm -hmm. automatically. It is why when you're around certain people and you start to feel like crap, you're feeling their crap. It is why when you're around certain people... Um, and you feel great around them or you feel uplifted or you feel 
um, wiser or you feel whatever you feel around them, you're connecting, your fields are connecting. And there is no, um, it gets tricky because there really is no time and space, so to speak. Um, so that can happen just by bringing your attention to somebody that is across the other side of the world. It happens on different levels. It happens always without trying, but there's also an intention, you know, where, simple example, somebody in the UK that I'm doing a, a session or healing on, we're not disconnected. We're not far apart, even though we're on different parts of the world. That's why I can still do what I do with them because our fields automatically entangle. That's mm. the way of connection. It's one of the ways of oneness, which is a universal truth. It's one of the laws of the universe, how the universe functions, the way of connection. Yeah, I believe uh, Dean Radin, Dr. Dean Radin, and uh, there's another guy. There's another guy. He's well-known. He, I think, is a little bit more well-known than D. Radin. What was the book that they wrote? Um, I think that he wrote a book called Supernatural or mm -hmm. Superhuman, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm trying to think. Have you heard of this book? No. Let me see if I can find it. Super normal, super normal. And it was written with uh, Deepak Chopra. And this book is crazy because they basically, first of all, it's very, it's a little bit of a difficult read because the beginning portion of it is basically them setting up all the things and like explaining all these scientific terms. Mm -hmm. It does feel like it was written for more of like a graduate level class. Mm -hmm. And it's very fascinating though, because he gets to the point of basically pointing out what you're talking about with telepathy and with this mm -hmm. connection of like this ether that's beyond our physical senses that we are yep. able to connect to. So how, you know, and I think maybe one more thing to kind of put out there before I get to the question, mm -hmm. especially with people in the spirituality community, myself included, tend to be more empathetic. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that that makes you more open to these energies that you're talking about. Yes. But then the con with it is that you let in so many of those energies that it becomes overwhelming. Yes. So I'm curious how you experience or found this, uh, your ability to see these energies and maybe any pitfalls that have come up because of it. Oh yeah. Good question. Um, so I've always been this way. I came in like this and as a very young girl, I would just look around and not understand what the hell was wrong with all the people around me. <laughs> it, it, when I was very young, you know, we didn't have the internet. There was nothing to look up. You couldn't Google anything. There was no social media app to jump on and see how other people were functioning. You know, you just live, I just lived with, why can't you see what I see? How do you not get this? And it was so frustrating for me as a child to look up at everybody and be like, like, what's wrong with you? Because I had no, you know, language or anything. To, I couldn't put words to it. I couldn't describe. It just was me. And so I just didn't understand why other people couldn't see and know the things that I could see and know. It was very frustrating, very hard, very lonely. Um, but over time, it was, a, for me, my personal journey was just understanding all the things that I see and why understanding what do I do with it? How do I manage it? It was just mastering myself. I had to master myself with all of this. Um, and in learning that you, the more you awaken, the more you are, you become expansive and that mean and divinely expansive. And yes, you awaken to a lot more of the subtle energies that are around us always, that universal matrix that is always here. The individual fields around certain people, as well as this massive collective one on the planet, you awaken more and more to that. You detect it, you sense it. And it is horrifying <laughs> all of the negative energies and the things that people actually have going on inside of them. It, it truly is. I don't say that to be negative. That was the hardest thing for me, one of the hardest things for me to overcome. How the hell do I manage that? I feel everything from everyone all the time. Um, but uh, one of the things that I teach and coach it, as the foundation of the work that we teach at, at Masters of Self University is how do you connect to your divine power and grow and expand that energy within yourself, period, and all the time so that you can call upon that 
and become more powerful in the moments where you are around people, around negative energies or tapping into things that are, quite frankly, they're, they're awful. Um, you learn how to master yourself energetically. So that's part of the process. That's part of the awakening. And then when it comes to truly elevating your level of consciousness, you have to then conquer, master the fact that, wow, this person is doing this or this ha- they're causing this harm or whatever they're doing, or they just feel awful. They're so negative. They're so whatever. How can I be in my divine place of no judgment? How can I become the way of compassion that doesn't justify, it doesn't excuse, it doesn't dismiss? We don't make excuses for other people showing up in terrible ways. We don't make excuses, but we also don't judge. We don't tolerate the misogyny, the hate, the separation. There, we, there should be zero tolerance. The more enlightened people come, the less tolerance they have with all of this stuff. That's the truth. But it comes with no judgment. There's no criticism. So when you become more divinely powerful as that, as the ways of oneness, I am the way of responsibility with this. I am the way of patience. I am the way of surrender. I am the way of truth. I am the way of connection. I am the way of compassion. For example, it is easy to deal with all of the things around you because while you're in the presence, I am the way of presence, while you're dealing with all of these other energies, because of how powerful you are becoming, you are literally alchemizing the energies around you just by being in that space. That's the kind of impact you get to have the more powerful you become in becoming the ways which are vibrational frequencies of the highest level of enlightenment that we can achieve in human form now. In that answer, a a big word that kept popping out of my head was the idea of boundaries. You seem like a very appropriately boundary. If you can, can you uh, repeat that? You froze on me. Oh, can you see me now? I can. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I said, I, you seem like a very appropriately, and I hope this comes across as a compliment. (laughs) You seem like an appropriately boundaried woman. And I'm interested how, if we're trying to take this perspective of oneness, how do Mm -hmm. boundaries, something that would appear to be, or feels to be protecting yourself or closing yourself off from other people, how do boundaries fit into a connection of oneness and everything is one? Yeah. Great question. Oh, I love this question. What a great question. So Boundaries are critical because one of one of the ways of oneness, it's number 14 out of 20, there are 20 ways of oneness, is the way of unconditional love. There is no such thing that you are in the vibrational frequency of unconditional love if you don't have boundaries. Let's understand why, because this is really critical to answer your question. Boundaries are not separation. Enabling is. Enmeshment is being dysfunctionally entangled in codependency, those are separation programs because they are separating you from divinity, from the power that you are. Boundaries, I'll give you an example. Oftentimes in, it's easy to say romantic relationships, oftentimes in in romantic relationships, somebody shows up in their wounding and what they do when they show up in their wounding, they're showing up as their inner child. So they're suddenly six years old in the relationship, for example. And what that energy, what they're programming, what their patterning does, I'm showing up as a little six-year-old right now, which means I'm making you my parent. And we create parent-child relationships. And then we wonder why the passion dies and why we fight and blah, blah, blah. That's just a whole domino effect of the relationship starting to go downhill. So in this example, a boundary, because I am the way of unconditional love, so I'm going to set them, a boundary is, oh, you're showing up as a little six-year-old right now. I will not function in that level of consciousness with you. Why? Because I'm better and I'm superior? No, it's ridiculous. Because I am the way of unconditional love. And if I entangle myself with you as a little six-year-old, wounded, powerless, immature, you know, whatever you're showing up as, I'm keeping you there. I'm joining you and saying, yes, I'm actually validating you, the energies that you are powerless, you're weak, you're immature, you're whatever you're showing up as. That's not love. 
a boundary to you being lacking divinity right now, that you are in your wounding right now. Setting a boundary looks like, oh, hey, I can see you're in your wounding right now. I'm not going to do this with you, but I will support you in you healing yourself through it. How can I best support you right now as you, as you heal yourself? See how I won't entangle myself in the, in the conflict and the argument. I won't, I won't, you're, you're a six-year-old right now. So there's my boundary. Now, am I judging you as that six-year-old showing up, that immature person in the relationship running some stupid program or projecting or creating conflict between us? Am I judging you for it? No. If I am, I'm the unconscious one and I need to separate right now to go heal myself because how dare I judge you for where you are right now? See it? That's oneness. That's oneness. I stay up in the way of unconditional love. And I simply invite you to heal and rise up and meet me up here. When I do that, I am giving you an opportunity to heal, to become more aware of how you're showing up, to rise and elevate beyond where you were just functioning. I'm giving you the opportunity. It doesn't mean you'll take it. But if I don't give you that opportunity, I'm not functioning in oneness. I'm functioning in separation consciousness by staying low with you, that low grade of consciousness. I stay up in the way of whatever way of oneness that I need to stay in unconditional love in this example. And as I do that, that means I've created the divine spaciousness for you to choose to come up and meet me up here too, for you to choose to heal yourself, to see what programs you're running, to alchemize them and elevate higher. I've now created the space for you to do that instead of suffocating you and trapping you down in your little six-year-old self who's powerless and throwing a tantrum. See it? Mm. That is oneness. That is oneness. Boundaries are not, you know, don't do this to me. That's ridiculous. Boundary is awe. I can see what you're trying to do here and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay up here, but I can love and support you while you heal. Oh, you don't want to? That's okay because I am the way of honoring. I won't be treated. I won't be talked to a certain way. That's where I set a boundary and I'm still honoring you. I'm not judging you for where you choose to be. It's interesting. In that response, it, I, I'm kind of getting this feeling of oneness is this more divine, natural state of being that we all have access to. Yeah. And so by setting these boundaries, namely with people who are not acting in terms of of oneness who are mm-hmm. acting in terms of lower dimensional frequencies. Yeah. We're setting these boundaries because it's saying like, no, I no longer want to be a part of a disconjointed and separate frequency. I, yes. my goal is on oneness. My goal is joining source. My goal is joining God. Yes. And if you're not a part of that, that's completely okay. I just don't have space in my energetic field for you. Yeah. I expand my space to accept you where you are, but I will not energetically entangle with it, which means I am perpetuating it. I am promoting it. I am putting the energy to make sure that continues to be a part of our relationship, our world, our community, whatever it is. I won't put the energy towards that. I put the energy towards elevation, rising above because that's truly what oneness is. But you can't do that. You're not literally doing that and functioning from that place. If you look down, if you judge, if you criticize the person for where they are, and that isn't the same thing as having no tolerance for it. Mm. Yeah, because if you're judging and criticizing, you're just being the polar, essentially. You're being the polar, the polarization. You're diving into like, I mean, the law of duality exists. You're basically taking on that reflection in this dualistic nature, which is ultimately bringing you down to that frequency as well. You're, you are jumping in to the, the pot of judgment. That's a, that's a negative. You're choosing not to be your divine self in that moment when we judge others for where they are. It doesn't mean where they are is, is okay or acceptable much of the time, you know, murdering somebody, raping, you know, that's not okay. (laughs) But that's the tough part. How do I alchemize? If I notice I am judging you for doing that, that means I'm saying I'm superior, you're inferior, I'm creating separation consciousness. That means I am not one of the universal ways of oneness, the way of equality. I'm actually creating inequality when I'm judging you as inferior to me. 
But it doesn't mean that murdering that person is acceptable or okay. I don't have any tolerance for you murdering that person. There's a difference. We don't tolerate murder. But when we are judging because we are nothing but energy, all we're doing is adding judgment, hate, separation, inequality. How are we? I don't add inequality. Yeah, you do when you judge another person. Wonder why there's so much inequality all over the world. Judgment is nothing but inequality. Hmm. That I'm somebody's playing superior and somebody's seen as inferior. You said something very interesting in there, and I think this is going to tie us back to the Putin example I had. Aaron Abke in uh, Odyssey number 058 also discussed this, mm-hmm. which is like judging a murderer, right? And I, and it's probably something to talk about because he literally even said, I'm cre-, he said something to the effect of whenever I judge the murderer, I am creating the murderer. And there's something there that seems very nuanced but also very wise. And I'm hearing it in your speech as well that you're bringing it up Mm -hmm. as as well. So if someone commits murder Mm -hmm. and I judge them as being a bad person, how is it that I'm creating them to be a murderer? I, so I'm going to get, I'm going to give a slightly different perspective on that. So please do when, if I, so this person over here is a murderer and I see them as a murderer. What I teach is to function from the way of truth. What is not my truth crap that people need to get rid of that nonsense. That comes from wounding and programming and ego. And it's ridiculous. It's the universal truth. That's one of the ways of, of oneness is the way of truth. What is the way of truth in this scenario? And we can look at, okay, this person is a murderer. Is that the truth here? Yes, let's start surface level. So if that is the truth, let's go into deeper the programs of what created that person to become a murderer. That doesn't mean, and that's for understanding pers- uh, purposes, because I am the, also the way of presence. You see, if I can understand, then I can do as a powerful divine being, I can do what it takes to learn from this alchemize the energies, the programs, the wounding that created this. And I can then move forward and learn how to teach and elevate other people to prevent this kind of thing. I can actually learn from this murderer. And it doesn't mean, and in order to alchemize all the hate and and the violence and all the things that created all the energetic programs, the emotional programs that created a murderer, because it's not like that, that person at one year, Picture a one-year-old baby. You don't say, oh, that baby's a sadistic molester is going to rape children. And that, that you, don't look at, you don't think that when you look at a one-year-old baby. That's no. a murderer right there. Oh, look how cute this murder. Oh, this one's going to rape babies. Look at this baby's going to rape babies when he's older. Just that, It just feels, feels gross just hearing you exactly, say that. Exactly. Exactly. Because it doesn't exist. It is created, though. It is created. But how so is that we, me? If I if I say, okay, he's a murderer, he's a bad yep. person, how is that how is that me creating him? It's not I don't think it's a perspective of you creating him. It's an energetic perspective of you keeping him where he's at. That's the this difference. This feels like it touches on cancel culture then, where if someone made a joke ten years ago. We think that we should destroy their lives because it was a terrible joke. It's that's the tough stuff. That's the challenging thing. I think people get into a cookie cutter. I don't like what you say, so you should be canceled. Grow, grow the hell up. It's ridiculous. However, are there people who have done such horrific things that now it is time to move through the consequences that you have earned from them? There's a difference. It isn't okay to just say, well, you know, I did that a long time ago. (laughs) I used to rape children. I don't do it anymore. I just went through a phase. (laughs) No, mm -mm. no, there should be consequences for that. So, you know, we have to be a little more mature in the way we handle things and the way we view things, though. 
But here's where the universal ways of oneness come in as a framework for that. Because it's let's let's come from the place of the way of truth. Let's come from the place of compassion. And let's really understand that society as a whole created what we're seeing. This is the oneness again. Okay, so how did I create that murderer? I may not have created that specific murderer right there in that moment. But do I create in our society the the programs, the patterns, the frequencies, the behaviors, the systems that allow somebody to easily become that and perpetuate that? That's the difference. And that is where I teach, yes, we absolutely do. Yes, we absolutely do that. We've created an entire world, communities, systems, global or otherwise, where look look at the prevalence of this stuff. Hello. You can't deny the facts. You can't deny the damn truth. Serial killers, mass shooters, rapists, human and sex trafficking upon the millions and millions. It's not like this is something that happened once six years ago and, oh my God, it happened a second time. It's every goddamn day, all of this stuff. So we're creating it. We are creating it. And it goes back to what I've offered earlier, which is where do we start? This is such a massive problem. Yes, it is. So let's get to work, individuals. Let's get to work. How can I elevate and heal myself and elevate so high and become so awakened that I can actually start to perceive and understand from the way of truth that how I show up in this world does actually contribute in some ways to perpetuating, creating, and making these people turn and making these men, because they're mostly men, turn into these things. If we Mm. deny that way of responsibility, we are the problem creating that. And we think it's them and not us. How did they get there? You know, this isn't a rare, random thing. We're talking about all of these examples that are terrifying to think about. They're very real and they're all over the world and they're very prevalent. So we are creating it. But where do we start is with ourselves and our everyday lives. And it seems to me that this starting point, it needs to be based in some sort of truth. And you discussed yeah. in that answer how there is essentially no subjective truth, that there's only an, ob- you didn't say subjective, I'm putting that word in there, but there's only objective truth. There's only capital T truth that exists. Yes. And yeah. All subje- if you land in the ball court of subjective truth, then it is likely, or I mean, I guess you're saying that it is a consequence of trauma or something else. So you, can you help me walk, can you help walk me through that? Because this is, this seems like a very powerful thing that this generation, this time period is really yeah. trying to work through at a collective level. Yeah. Yes. And it's, we're trapped in a lot of victim consciousness stuff. We're trapped in powerlessness. These are some of the programs running. We're trapped in powerlessness is huge. Why? Because I need everybody else to validate me and understand my perspective. This is such an immature way to live our lives. It is mentally immature. It is emotionally immature. It is spiritually immature. Because when we come from my truth and my perspective, my opinion matters, I'm coming from a little toddler that that is still used to being the center of the universe. Everybody, all eyes on me versus growing up and maturing out of that means what is the truth here, not my truth? Think about this. If a little kid, a a three-year-old is told when they ask for cookies before dinner, well, no, you can't have cookies before dinner. And they flip out and throw this tantrum. Well, their truth is you said, no, you're mean. You don't love me. That's their truth. Because they don't have the cognitive ability to understand that having two cookies actually is enough to fill them up on junk and sugar and they don't want that what it does to their body and then it'll make them full and then they won't eat the healthy things they need. They won't get the nutrients they need. You can't explain that to a three-year-old. They don't have the capacity yet. So a parent just says, you can't have cookies before dinner. And then the kid flips out. What's my truth? You're mean. You're this. You're that. Fast forward. Second example. In a lot of relationships, it could be business, it could be friendships, but I'm going to go to romantics. That's always an easy one. 
in romantic relationships, you don't appreciate anything I do. <laughs> That's my truth. You don't appreciate anything I do. When really what the program is running that they are projecting onto their partner is the dismissive parent who didn't validate their emotions when they were upset and crying and told him to stop crying like a little girl. Grow up, be a man. All that patriarchal nonsense, that sexism that we're taught when we're so young, those programs are energetically a part of who we are until we awaken to them. So this my truth crap, what is the universal truth in that example? And the truth, the way of truth, that universal way of oneness is you don't have the ability to see past your wounding right now that just because your partner wants to talk about something that is upsetting her in this relationship doesn't mean she doesn't appreciate the things that you do. The truth is you were so wounded and trapped at six years old. You don't have the emotional IQ yet and the emotional capacity to stop viewing everything that somebody says to you as a direct personal attack on you when actually she's bringing this up in the relationship because she loves you so much. She doesn't want anything wrong in the relationship between the two of you. She's trying to heal and elevate this relationship, but because you're trapped in your six-year-old wounding, my truth, my truth, you don't appreciate me. She actually loves and appreciates you so much. She wants to heal this thing that is negatively affecting the relationship. That's the universal truth here. So you learn the work, you learn to do this type of work, you learn, I'm triggered right now because she brought something up, which means I have something to heal within myself. And as the way of responsibility, I'm going to go do that first. And then we're going to continue this conversation. Why? Because I will be a little more healed to become the way of presence for what it is that you want to discuss that just triggered me. I'm not dismissing you. I realize I have a wounding because my dad dismissed me when I was little and then judged and criticized me all the time. And because of that, I'm projecting that onto you. That's what got activated right now when you said, I'm really upset with you about this. <gasps> Defensiveness. Ah, I'm in my wounding. That's the difference. That's functioning from the way of truth. Mm. How does this, because these are very powerful individual examples and it seems like that there's a parallel here with some more societal examples, such mm -hmm. as the one thing you mentioned in there, the patriarchy, yeah. that seems to be a big one. And I think it's also a very difficult one, at least that I've seen to break down whenever people say that. Mm -hmm. The other one that seems to come up a lot is whenever it comes to transgender and all these different gender things that are yep. um, getting thrown around at this time. Mm -hmm. How... Are you able to break down from this same perspective what's going on in those two more mass mass uh I hate to say untruth but like just these these bigger these bigger elements that seem yeah. to have a rocky foundation let's say yeah and I I don't have all the puzzle pieces but what from the way you're breaking this down where does that fit into this bigger picture of objective truth it comes from when you learn this work it's what programs am i running and when i so desperately don't feel validated in my life i'm going to force everybody around me to validate me and make me feel like i'm good for being me that's a level of immaturity they're functioning as as toddlers at best this is a spiritual, mental, emotional level of immaturity where I'm running, but I'm in an adult body now so that I can now make these dysfunctional and distorted waves ripple out into the world. When I hate myself so much, I do not love who and what I am. What I do, this is how programming works. What I do is I will seek out everyone else around me to validate me. And if they don't validate me the way that I want them to, they are now the enemy, even if I'm in distortion, right? So if I was a healed, whole, elevated divine being who actually functions as the way of unconditional love, which means I don't lack self-love. And if I was that being, and I chose as a cognitively mature enough emotionally mature, healed whole adult to be different than how I was born, for example. If I chose to dress differently, be differently, even go through a sex change, 
if I was emotionally, mentally mature enough to make that choice and that's how I want to live my life, I wouldn't need anybody's approval for that. I wouldn't have to call anybody, project onto other people that they hate me (laughs) because (laughs) they won't change how they address me and all this crap. It's absolute nonsense. I'm coming from separation consciousness. I'm coming from powerlessness. I'm coming from weakness and I'm coming from self-hate. When I project onto others that they hate me, when I want everybody to drop everything and function in my truth, whatever, however distorted it is. If I choose to simply be different than how I was born, I applaud you. The way of honoring, if I was an elevated being becoming enlightened, I would simply honor myself for choosing to be that and wanting to be that and saying, hey, this is what works for me. This feels good to me. I love this about myself. I want to be different in a healthy way for me. That is fabulous. And then I can trust within my own divinity that this is how I want to move through this life experience and experience the world as something that I wasn't born as. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. I applaud. Great. Beautiful. Right. But if I am in dysfunction, if I am unhealed, if I am running programs of inferiority, then I'm going to make everybody else the enemy and I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm trapped in victim consciousness. If I function in programs of hate for myself, I am going to project out there that you hate me and you don't accept me as I am when I'm the one being out of control, functioning from a level of insanity, where in my separation consciousness, I'm trying to erase biological women from existence. Why? I hate myself so much. If I take away what you are, because that's really what I want to be, if I take away and erase what you are, I'll somehow feel better about myself and I'll be able to accept myself more easily. These are the deep-rooted programs that are running here. It goes way beyond just, this is an inclusion when you're trying to erase women from the picture. You know, it's separate. It is the extremest form of separation, one of them, instead of if I really truly loved myself for who I am, it doesn't matter if you over there accept me or not, because it literally doesn't. Now, I'm not talking about people hating. I'm not talking about anything like that. We should honor everybody for who they choose to be. Beautiful. But on the same note, when you're not mature and when you're a child and you don't have the cognitive ability to think about consequences of the future or comprehend what your decisions are past what you did an hour ago, what are we doing here? It's all dysfunctional. It's unhealthy. It's toxic. It's dangerous. It's pretty damn scary. And it stems from programming that is... I hate myself. I don't love myself. Which why I have to force you to do a certain thing or say a certain, address me in a certain way. It's, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. You know, so a lot of healing needs to happen. And people who are truly elevated and healed and whole and love themselves, as I mentioned, they have compassion for themselves that I feel very different. And I'm going to choose to live differently. The way of compassion. I am the way of compassion for that. I am the way of honoring for that. I am the way of unconditional love for that. But you can't force your dysfunction on everybody else. And not anybody who is a, a transgender person is in dysfunction. Let me be very clear. And, and nobody in, in the way of unconditional love, for example, should think that they are, right? But there is certainly a group of people that are, and they're, and they're spreading their toxicity out. On, they're projecting in an extreme way onto the rest of the world right now. Mm. It's interesting because I watched, I think it was Matt Walsh. He had a documentary. Did you watch this? What is a Mm -hmm. woman? No, but I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I didn't watch it. It's very, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really stuck out to me, I made this comment, I was watching with people. I made this comment out loud whenever we were watching it. The people who were kind of performing the, there was, you know, obviously there were two groups of people. There were kind of Mm -hmm. people who were like, you know, uh, there's a biological, what's the word I'm looking for here? There's a biological component to this, you know, chromosomally speaking, X, X, Y, X, Y. And then there's the component of this self validating other people if they want to get this change operation. Right. So you kind of fit in these two camps and it really, I hate to kind of put it that way. That feels a little bit disingenuous, but 
the core concept I'm trying to go for, the people who are advocating for, let's say, operating on kids at a young yeah. age versus the people who were saying like, okay, yeah, like gender dysphoria is a thing, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a small population. It's a lot smaller than the numbers we're seeing. You know, the, you know, we need to look at this from a more scientific approach. I was paying attention deeply to how the words were being spoken by the people in each of those camps. Mm -hmm. And it felt like the people who were on the more on the side of like, let's look at this objectively, mm -hmm. they felt more grounded. Mm -hmm. They felt more resolute in what they were saying. Mm -hmm. And I found this to be a very fascinating parallel that kept popping up. And I noticed it about halfway through the movie. And then as it kept going on, it just became, it kept becoming more clear and clear and clear mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe there is something to this because I'll be honest, I very much for a long period of time and maybe even up until this conversation, I was very much like, okay, there's objective truth and subjective truth. But even in what you're describing here, I'm starting to lean towards what you're saying, which is there is objective truth. And it's almost that there aren't too many things that are subjective outside of it. Like, and, and I don't, I, I guess I'm kind of struggling for words right now because I'm not really sure what to do with that because that seems like a very, huh? So let me, what, let me, let me throw this yeah, in there. Help me out. So here. we are a society that is not, we are so low in our grade of consciousness. We're not a society that values what actual real education is. As much as we say education, education is great. Yeah, the systems that actually keep you dumbed down and brainwashed and only educate a certain way, that's not true education. So I want to be very clear in my definition of education um, before I say what I'm going to say. We are not a system that promotes true education. So we don't grow up, for example, learning um, child development before and becoming educated in this stuff before we ever have kids. We are brainwashed that you just automatically grow up, get married and have kids for the most part. You just have, you, you don't think about it. Of course, you're going to grow up and have babies. That is brainwashing. Mm. How do you prepare yourself to become a parent who actually knows how to parent, what it means to be a parent, what the sacrifices are, and what it means to be the first divine teacher of this little soul that came in to have a human experience? Because if we really were educated, we would understand all the different varying phases that children go through and why they're going through them. And then we wouldn't call them something they're not, which is nothing but fucking insanity. For example, I was a pediatric and an adult therapist in my career. I, special, I specialized in pediatrics for years. And you would have pediatric patients who <laughs> would come in, there's now a new baby they're the older sibling. There's a new baby. And as the baby is getting all of the attention, it's an older brother, for example. The new baby is a little girl. It's a little sister. And after a while that, that the older brother is going, seeing all of the attention that the little girl is getting, they pick up on all of our societal cues of what it means to be a little girl. And as that baby is growing older, there's all these behavioral problems with the, the sibling. And I used to deal with you know, behavioral, one of the things that I did, I dealt with behavioral issues, right? So they would come in for therapy and suddenly they're dressing like a girl and suddenly they have mm. all these behavioral issues. And suddenly in some, there would be anger and violence. You would have a, a four-year-old boy, like suddenly being very violent and dangerous and it's scaring the parents and that, the, you know, he hurt his little sister. And there are other examples of playing with the dolls and speaking like a, a baby and talking like a girl, changing his voice and all this stuff. Like that is, has nothing to do with gender identity for the love of fucking Christ. He doesn't understand why he is suddenly not the center of his parents' universe. And he isn't at a cognitive ability because of his age to comprehend by simply explaining to him, well, there's a baby. They require so much more demand and attention. You're a little bit older. You can handle this now. You can't say that to a three-year-old. They don't understand. They can't comprehend it. They aren't at a cognitive level to comprehend that. So what do they do? They see all this attention that the little girl's getting. 
They see all the toys that the little girl is being played with, that plays with, and then all the adults are playing with these things. And suddenly that's what they want to do. Why? Because that's what they're, she's getting all the attention by being this way. And in part three, which releases on Saturday, we're going to dive even deeper into this whole gender identity issue and conversation. We're going to talk about the medical interventions, alchemizing our energetic programs. This is going to be a very powerful part. We're going to talk about accountability and accessing that divine power that's within all of us. Yes, I promise you it's within you too. And in order to come closer to that divine power, one option you have is to listen to part three, gender identity, self-mastery, and divine power, which is going to release on Saturday at 7 a.m. 